Italy are asking questions about relationships and you know where they're going through and all this, whether they are in them or not in them. Uh, but still, it's a very active topic. But most importantly, today is Evia and mine anniversary. Today is literally five, uh, four years after I have come down the steps and saw her for the first time in Bali. So, so we decided it's it's very appropriate to, to celebrate it, uh, you know, we, instead of going for our little private massage and, 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 and things for two. Well, I think after four years, we can uh, celebrate with all you guys. And, uh, you know, some of you have seen us at the day one together, <laughs> <coughs> some not, but um, this is it. We, we would we would like to have a good cup of tea <laughs> with all of you. Yeah. For that occasion. And uh, well, uh, some of the topics have been really accumulating themselves as we have been together and working because from the day one, you know, it was we were both. Uh, well, uh, day one, we didn't even kind of have an idea that uh, we are going to go this path. We, I just came for the session. And you see what happens at session. <laughs> Four years later it's on, we are still in a session. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it can last for a long time. But <clears throat> one, uh, one extremely curious detail was that uh, in the session, well, I don't usually reveal the content of session, but <laughs> but this was this was amazing that uh, in full neutrality, actually, I announced that Vittoria is ready for a divine union, and that you know he just needs to find a person for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So here we are, and. Um, deeper than ever involved into, into exploring the consciousness of, uh, of, of relationship, uh, the dynamics of being, you know, in relationship, uh, the depths and triggers and everything you can possibly encounter when you commit to the growth together. And we have accumulated quite a database because our journey has been um, uh, extremely original and uh, yeah, not not conventional in any ways, and it has taught us uh, some very profound truths and ideas about how it well, works. It is still teaching us, so <laughs> yeah. So we would like to probably start this sharing with, uh, as usual, uh, turning it to you guys, and actually really kind of there's a lot of us on the call so let's kind of really concentrate on what would be maybe either one burning question or one burning topic around relationships and uh around working well let's call it really about relationships one of the what is the most like distill it to the most burning one that uh, you would like to kind of put out there for discussion so that uh, all of this is included in this in this call mm -hmm. today and also our, our little disclaimer as usual uh, don't be surprised if what you thought uh, sounds different from from our side so uh, we'll yeah. go beyond so the, the whole point is to go beyond what we think and what we have what we are used to think and really look behind to the profound mechanics of uh, of relationship um, energies. Mm -hmm. So put out your questions so we make sure that we include them. We have compiled a little selection of uh, seven myths that we encounter the most about relationships because after many, many sessions, you know, they're very much repeating. So we have compiled our seven myths and mm -hmm. uh, give your input and put your questions so and it will be sure interesting to see if it actually enters one of these myths or you know we we can call them myths we can also call them like i put on the email these are the lies that we tell ourselves and then we pretend oh we don't know anything about it but uh it is uh 
really, really cool to uh, catch ourselves lying to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. So we have already like... a question from uh, Anna: What to do when it gets tough instead of running away? Yes, <laughs> we will. We will speak about that. Ah, beautiful question. Mm -hmm. Instead of running away, exactly. Yeah. Thank you for that question. So. Yes, uh, Marina. Hi, uh, we're speaking or, 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 or chatting with the time? Speaking, we speaking. can speak. OK, OK. Uh, sorry about the dogs uh, in Bali. I have questions. <laughs> um, so here's the, the constant dilemma. They're, wow. <laughs> wow, they have a lot to say. They really have a lot to say. So there's the. There's the opinion of, um, you know, being ready and getting into relationship. Um, particularly what I'm f finding out is that um, um, as a woman, right? Like being ready, re having this relationship with myself built up before I'm getting into something that is really kind of, you know, I want to commit, I want to mm -hmm. find a partner and, and all of that. So, okay. I mean, I spent most of my life chasing really very superficial relations with people and I'm and I'm kind of dedicating end of my 30s and beginning of my 40s with building up relationship with myself but then so there's that thought of like you know build yourself up and then obviously attract something that will kind of mirror that but then there is also a thought of like well you're learning how to be in them while you're in them you can't really just stay outside observe what's going on and then all of a sudden be ready for something and jump in because that's not working out either so I guess that's my dilemma. Like wh when, when do I know? And, and how does that feel? And like, what, you know, I, I have no idea. Like, when am I, when am I cookie that's done baking? You know what my friend used to say, like, <laughs> you know, maybe you're just a cookie not finished baking, you know, I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, Thank you. Fan fantastic, uh, fantastic perspective. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, we will include this. I can only say, tell you straight on, on the spot that uh, for the cookie to be baking, well, relationship is the heat. You add more heat to it, mm -hmm. so you bake faster. <laughs> but also that there is a too early as well. Uh, so we will cover that. Too much fire will burn the cookie. Yeah. So, you know, it's about dosing. So, yeah. Exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Beautiful Thank you so much. much. Thank you, Marina. We will definitely include it. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, David. Hi. Yeah. Hey, it's been a while. <laughs> it's nice to see you. Yeah. Uh, cool. I have a question. Actually, it's uh, more like uh, related to the masculine and feminine energies. And so I, I guess uh, you will have lots to share about this issue. I, I see a lot of like, uh, like people working on themselves and that includes me struggling especially the guys like really uh anchoring the the male the masculine energy and so i just i mean i just observed my parents today and i see this kind of like oh my god i don't want this to happen it's uh they, they were cutting bread and anyway they just keep bickering at each other and basically the the masculine is like uh i mean my my, my dad my dad was like not sure what is the right way to do and my mom directs and is like oh you don't do this and it's like this kind of, this kind of so intense energy not trusting and so there's lack of um trust uh, towards i mean confidence towards himself my dad and my my mom doesn't trust him either so it's it always gets blocked in a way and so uh that would be interesting to have insights about uh um easing the relationships between the uh, wounded masculine, as it, it's said mm -hmm. in uh, spiritual communities, mm -hmm. and uh, and the divine feminine. I see the, this uh, relationship in a kind of, uh, how to say, conceptually, but how to do it practically? That's a mm -hmm. question. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, thank you. Thank you, David. This mm -hmm. is uh, also a great question. Yes, the, 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 the play of uh, inner masculine and feminine is indeed the basis of interaction between people. And if you get that part, then everything else is just, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a behavior. Yeah, we'll get into that, including 
some wrong ideas what is the divine masculine and what is the divine feminine that are you know kind of being sold through the new age movement so we will definitely go, get that as well mm -hmm. uh, yes anna hello everyone so yeah i have this question we just like um, coming alive again uh, these days a lot because um, I mean, I'm speaking from experience, like whenever I really felt this attraction to someone that I didn't have any doubt whether I wanted to meet them or not, it would have been like a bomb at some point. So like a huge lesson, and, you know, like um, in either toxic or hurtful or lessons. So didn't really work so far. Right. So now I am in a point where I'm kind of like questioning myself because I, I met like three men at the same time. And they all are super interested, all three, but I don't really feel super attracted to any of them. And then I ask myself, is it like me sabotaging myself from something that could actually work? Because all of them are super nice and look good and everything. It's just like, I don't feel anything, right? And then I'm like, is it my self-sabotage program? Oh, this could work, so I don't want it, you know, I'm not interested. So my question basically is, how do I know whether I'm like sabotaging myself in a way? or whether really it's not that yet. <laughs> mm. uh, no, no, maybe it's your wish from Make-A-Wish course coming through uh, in blast <laughs> three months at the same time. Oh. <laughs> maybe it's like coming now, it's like from all directions. I'm like, ah, I don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> mm. There's that yeah, drought, 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 and then flood. Exactly. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Great, great question. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. We will yeah, definitely we'll cover, cover that. <laughs> and uh, Bella's hand is up. Bella. Hey, everyone. Good morning. Hi. Um, I, I want to, I, I actually have a similar question as Anna's, but then I won't ask it. I ask a different one because kind of the, the, the importance of attraction in a relationship uh, both in the beginning as, as a like a choice factor, right? Like, is that the right person for me or not? And in terms of like how important it is in the long term for more for the, for the spiritual growth, right? Uh, I think that's something that's always on everyone's mind. And, and but my question is more about, you know, that the current pandemic situation has really shifted dynamics of relationships where we're, we have become sort of everything for each other right either like people who are single are uh alone and like they can't find anyone or they're stuck and just really like having to look at each other <laughs> 24 hours a day like every day and my question is how much of the relationship is really like you know because we we end up doing things together that are not really necessarily i think important for the relationship and for personal growth um like it, and I feel personally that, that this like taking care of the house, taking care of uh, children, taking care of everything together is actually like distracting from the from the primary role of a relationship of this personal growth. So I'm just curious to know from you, like, I mean, on a practical level, like there's obviously you have to figure out like what is the way to separate those things, but in your opinion, how important it is to sort of not get into the rut of doing everything together, right? In a relationship to be able to focus on uh, kind of what is the main purpose of a relationship anyways, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, I feel like a lot of times these other tasks uh, get in the way of what is it that we came here to do together. Mm -hmm. and, and the pandemic has even, has made it almost like, worse or maybe i'm wrong maybe it is that it is that we have to sort of face all of these different issues together as a couple that's kind of my <laughs> dilemma <laughs> yeah yeah great great uh, let's just clarify there are two questions so second yeah. is the purpose of the relationship and this uh, purpose of the confinement and like being squeezed together but per first part of your question was the importance of initial attraction and physical yeah. attraction. So let's not forget there are both of those because both are super important. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thank you, Val. Thank yeah, thanks. 
there is a purpose in relationships indeed so it's not just uh, you know spending time together there is a purpose and and uh, quick response to pandemic situation you know it's uh, like this game of musical chairs that music is going and then uh, music stops and you have to sit somewhere and you are where you are <laughs> and that also tells a lot if you are kind of stuck single or if you're stuck uh, with someone 24/7 that is the most important thing you need to see because we're the globally this time is about finding the balance so the balance within without and in every possible way so whatever situation on whatever kind of uh, uh, picture it has stopped well that's where you have to look really really you have to stare that's where deeply the, in that the microscope is you know, and, let's look at this and you know and it's amazing how the situation you know some people who are like now at home and seeing uh, what the woman has been doing all along by herself at home they say wow you are were you doing this the whole time every day like they realize the amount of uh, of work that it takes to maintain a household so different perspectives are brought in uh, we discover different faces of our partners so it's uh, it's a unique opportunity where we can't, we can't wiggle out of uh, a certain not show lessons. something <laughs> yeah but uh nowhere to go first part of the question is important too so yeah we'll get more into detail about both of those so we have Eve. eve's hand up and there was a question from oana how do you heal lack of trust in a relationship okay for sure yeah we will go into that Eve. Good morning, good evening. <laughs> um, I think my biggest question in terms of relationships, so for me, I, oh, my, so my, me and my husband, we've been together for like 18 years and the balance for us is pretty special in our family. And um, I feel very privileged to be in such a beautiful relationship and I spend a lot of time trying to balance the relationship and harmonize it between the six of us which is quite a lot of energy um, to really balance four children and him and our you know and that whole sort of mixture in this cauldron of us the thing that I struggle with is when I bring more people so when I have other people join us from outside this kind of like, uh, I don't know what word to use, but um, this collective of six of us and then how when one person comes in, how it really then affects the balance of the energies and how other people get affected. So it makes me a little bit, I'm a little bit like, kind of like <laughs> almost, don't want to let anyone else in because it really disrupts my harmony and then and then it takes me a long time to get it sort of settled again like especially the children you know because they're so vulnerable with their energies and how they're growing you know just one person added in and it just affects them which then affects me and then you know so I guess it's like how how can I find that balance of how often I allow someone into my home out to you know and how do I choose and do I need to be this overprotect I you know it's like I'm sort of trying to balance this at the moment mm -hmm. because you know when it's just the six of us I'm really happy but when I bring someone else in it's just like oh god now I've got to like rebalance the mixture of the cake because you know a little bit too much of this and then it all just doesn't quite work out so yeah that's that's I don't know if that's kind of in line with what you're offering but that's mm -hmm. where I'm stuck with relate external relationships out of my mm -hmm. yeah I love it when you say when it's just six of us you know <laughs> <laughs> just four children and two of you it's like a just yeah, and a dog and the dog who also needs his and balance as well yeah wonderful <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's yeah, yeah. It's there, great. there is a point, mm -hmm. especially for you, um, mm -hmm. where actually not not to. Look, it's not quite in our topics, but I would like to answer you straight away. You know, you're saying that you, it's all in your hands to balance it out. So, 
in in your case if you are the one to harmonize the relationships you would rather um, invest in teaching everybody their own emotional kind of in, independence and self-sufficiency mm -hmm. so if you because you can't hold it forever you know there will be schools and you know sometime the world will open again uh -huh. you'll meet people so you might as well teach what you do to every individual of your family mm -hmm. so that they can actually do it for themselves and for each other yeah it's just getting them to uh trust me you know because they're all like little and you know what does she know kind of thing you know but yes you're, you're right I mean that's ultimately my my role as their as their guide as they grow and nurt and grow up but yes I absolutely I I see your point yeah you you teach them emotional independence and uh, resilience uh, when facing unexpected situations and uh, new people so that you don't have to be there 24 seven for mm -hmm. the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anyone else? Uh, okay, can I, do you hear me guys? Yes, hi. Hi, okay. I didn't know that I should raise my hand, but I'm raising it now. No, it's okay. What's your I name? My name is Denisa. Denny. Ah, Denise. Nice to uh, meet you. Nice to meet you. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, hear all these perspectives that I could identify to a certain extent with each one. Um, I have a question about conflicts. It's uh, absolutely normal for people to, to have a uh, conflict in a relationship. Uh, the question is, how do people fight or how do they resolve it? And is there any protocol or any advice in this regard that you can suggest? Mm, yes. Wonderful. Yeah, thank <laughs> wonderful. you. There, there is indeed a protocol of fighting. Uh, we've been implementing it. It works very well. <laughs> <laughs> a fighting we're protocol? A very civilized <laughs> fight. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. Conscious fight. Question from Anita. We will definitely cover it, yeah? Question from Anita is when I really feel attraction, that moment it gets tough. It's hard to open up and go towards harmony. How can I heal this kind of relationship anxiety? So it gets tough when you really feel attraction. Okay. But it's like a panic or, mm -hmm. or, or I don't know what to do or losing. Uh, <clears throat> losing. Yes. If, uh, my, yes, my answer is kind of, I'm not panic, but I feel a little bit of pressure inside and, and uh, that it's not important what the other person thinks, but maybe it's my, from my family that I want to a little bit make everything well and not to lose the person's interest, but but not too much. I don't want to be too much in mm -hmm. the same time. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, we understand. Yeah, yes. thank you, Anita. We will, <laughs> we will certainly go, cover that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> Wonderful. Cool. Then, uh, any other burning questions, or we dive right in? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, okay, David is act, uh, adding the clarification to his question. Okay, we get it. Mm -hmm. Can I ask something? Sorry. Uh, yes, who is speaking? Let me see. Hola, yes. Sorry, I just I just opened the home door. Mm -hmm. I'm just here. <laughs> yeah, just. Tada! Oh. Yeah. Sorry, guys. I've been driving home, trying to be as quick as I could. Um, mm -hmm. So what's the question you have, Ola? Well, I, my question is based around, you know, um, it's based, uh, it's mostly about the fear of coming to relationship. Mm -hmm. Like how, um, how I, how, how, 
you know, I just want to kind of overcome or at least deal with that in a in the best possible way. It's something what really, I know I'm almost projecting of being, you know, what can happen in the future, even before it even started. <laughs> and it based on my, you know, past, you know, being badly hurt. Like I'm really wanting, you know, I'm really willing and I'm opening up to, you know, whatever the future can be. But I know deep down, it's pretty much based on trust. Like I have difficulties to trust. And I know it's an essential um, thing to have a relationship with not only the female male or any kind of intimate, but like even the relationship in a family when the trust is broken is um, is becoming very, very difficult. So I, you know, the trusting, what, what, what can you do? What can I do? What can, what can be done more mm-hmm. towards, you know, building the trust and being able to you know open up a bit more yeah that's a good question Mm -hmm. the question of trust and question of fear into entering relationship is so that we don't have the same hurts as before Mm -hmm. okay Okay. (laughs) so thank you and uh i guess let's start Mm-hmm. If we want to to cover the whole uh, picture, and we see your question, Anna, so it's 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 there. Mm-hmm. Okay, beautiful. Thank you for sharing these topics. It's all of them, of course, are very very interesting, and we will cover them. And uh, so, uh, let's maybe start with uh, examining how the relationship dynamics happen on three levels. So that you can see on which level you know you you want to interact or even understand uh, the the patterns, mm-hmm. and the first level is relationships, any kind of relationships, romantic, uh, business partners, family, mm-hmm. uh, any kind of interacting between two people. The like let's say normal standard automatic uh, unconscious uh, relationship is basically you can remember from everything we have shared that it's uh, a bunch of uh, conditions patterns wounds hurts parents feel the 18 frames of mind walking around and you know like you have uh, grids and grids and grids of conditionment and and they are clashing with other people's grids and then you know getting entangled and uh, creating uh, tensions beautiful visual picture for this level of relationship you can imagine if you have ever seen that floating uh boat mine you know that uh the 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 sea mine to kind of explode the boats so it's like a ball that has triggers all over like a little hedgehog so it waits that the boat hits it from any point to start the explosion so you have like these two uh minds going towards each other they feel attracted so first that will get in contact are the triggers so one trigger triggers the other one and it becomes explosive right away so that's the visual explanation of this first level this is when we still have those triggers sticking out of us Mm, at this level of relationship the uh, the wounds and the most urgent triggers are magnetized to each other together with strong attraction. So this is what explains that, you know, you're super attracted to someone, but it's, it turns out to be a super problem in your life because it's, uh, it's meant to be so. The level of attraction is proportionate to the problem that needs to be solved. The most ancient, uh, long overdue, and complex and complicated the problem the stronger the attraction to make sure that you actually kind of uh, you know collide together and stay for a while in order to play out the the wound and at this level it's really it's it's very scary you know to be in relationship because it can it's full of fears uh, uncertainties doubts mm-hmm. uh, yeah. And, and all sorts of, uh, of mental kind of uh, Because at anxieties. this point, we don't know from where the conflicts are coming. It seems like they're participating and falling from the sky, and we don't know where to expect them and when. 
because we don't understand really fully why they're happening. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems pretty much out of control. Mm -hmm. And uh, after a while, after you know being in several kind of that relationship, and again, not only with a romantic partner, but with business partners and any mm -hmm. other person, uh, we understand that somehow it it has the pattern. It has similarities. You know, you mentioned. Uh, difficulties to trust because we've been hurt before so things are repeating and at that level we understand okay do I stop then relating to people at all or what do I do if systematically it ends up in a very similar way so then the next stage of relationships is you say okay like no more of this I want to understand and that's where you can start thinking about conscious relationships Conscious relationships adds the level of awareness to this seemingly chaotic process of uh, of highs and lows and uh, and this and that 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 is completely out of control. When you become conscious about what the relationships are for, how does it work? What is the underlying mechanism? How can you use it for your personal growth? Uh, what are the, the interplays of uh, masculine and feminine? That means you are consciously trying to exist and, uh, and co-create with another person and use, it, use the relationship as a platform for your individual growth. Mm -hmm. Most important question at this level is how is the other person mirroring me? If you look at those two mm -hmm. C minds again and those bunch of triggers going towards each other, the decision for the level two of the relationships is I will find my triggers. I will find my ones because for too long I've been looking out and I haven't even seen what spikes come out of me as my triggers. So I will understand the mechanism of my own triggers and I will own my own triggers and whenever they happen, I will sit down and look carefully into them until I find them. So mm -hmm. this is the step number one, really. Yeah, what makes really relationship conscious is taking responsibility for one's own reactions and the work that we have to do within relationship. And, uh, you know, those who have uh, taken the course of meet the parents, you, you see that, uh, you know, we keep saying there's no other. Uh, there's no other in the sense that uh, they don't do it on purpose and they probably don't do what they do to you to every uh, every person they did that to you because you invited it in your in your field and um, the conscious element is recognizing uh, that it's you who feels then it's you who needs to see why you feel the way you feel and and this kind of relationship can really be uh, a source of beautiful, uh, you know, beautiful shifts and uh, and tremendous spiritual growth. Like super accelerated, accelerated growth, growth. Uh, including and even the risks when you are conscious about the risks and triggers and everything that it can bring. It becomes less kind of random and scary because you just know what's underneath and in this conscious stage of, uh, of, uh, of relating, you, you're very, very aware and checking every day in where do you stand in that relationship. Um, and not only romantic uh, partner, but anyone that you interact with. And how can, you, how can you also contribute to the other people in their, in their journey by holding the field consciously and without being dragged in into their processes so that's the consciousness element in relationship consciousness really to repeat it once again it is all the question main question is owning my own shit owning my own things my own triggers and my own emotions mm -hmm. owning them that's really number one mm -hmm. So, and the third, uh, no, if we don't, uh, we haven't seen the Marshall uh, Rosenberg. Rosenberg. Yeah. yeah, we'll check it out. And, and the third level, so what we call the divine union is the stage that comes after the conscious relationship. It's the, it's the exalted state of conscious relationship where you actually have so much understood that there is no 
you know, there is no other than you and uh, God basically interacting and playing out the consciousness in every possible way, you have come to that conclusion and you have proofs and experiential knowledge about it. And you have solved so many problems already and you habitually see that mirror and, and that it's have... not really surprising nor novel anymore. Yeah. It is your like everyday living like this. Mm -hmm. And that, that you understand like whatever comes in your life, you, you clearly understand what it means for you. So at that level, you, you're ready to step into divine, divine union where you recognize that the other person is, is literally the divine speaking, delivering messages to you, whether you like them or not, and that you are the, uh, the messenger of divine delivering the messages to the other, whether he likes it or not. So you stop judging or blaming the other altogether because he's just a messenger, you know, you don't hit uh, the, <laughs> the delivery guy because he brought you bad news, you know. Uh, so yeah, you don't focus, kill the postman. Don't kill the postman, focus on, on the message instead of uh, kind of uh, attacking the messenger. And that is the main difference and foundational truth for uh, divine um, unions, where the message is the most important and you lovingly embrace the messenger and also recognize that sometimes you have to, to be the messenger of, uh, you know, bad news for the other, and that's the way it is. And you don't resist and you don't hold back something that could be very precious for the other person's growth. And there's a peace and um, peace and surrender around, around these aspects of uh, who, who is, uh, you know, who is guilty, it doesn't even exist, you know, who does what and who is what doesn't exist. You, you just witness in awe how uh, that consciousness is playing out through both of the partners and, uh, mm -hmm. and just follow, uh, you know, with joy. And when we say these three levels, it uh, is fluid. Uh, it doesn't mean that you finish one stage and then enter fully in the other stage. Then you finish the second stage and enter fully in the third. It kind of, you know, like ripples in and out as the consciousness is growing. So, you know, we can be in this first stage where the triggers are already very active and already kind of getting into the second stage where we start seeing them. Then we see them more and more and more. And, you know, we start almost never getting in the first one that we are fully. Uh, taken by our triggers. We always have this little uh, observer outside saying, mm, but this is, even though I strongly feel it, it's, I know it's not fully true. So let me try to see it really for what it really is. Already that kernel of observer is kind of anchoring the second stage as more uh, stable than the first one. And then at times we get into the third stage that everything beautifully flows, but then we get sucked back in the second stage, third, second, third, second, and third, until we conquer almost like hours of the day that we are trying to be in that divine stage. And maybe we have it for now, like four hours per day. Then next month you will have it six hours per day and so forth. So it goes like this uh, in waves. We can totally have a potential for divine union and still be battling at the stage of pure uh, wounded relationships full on. And then we have moments of clarity and then back again to the battlefield. So, so it's a process. So the, you know, divine union has nothing to do with being holy and kind of lovingly including everything and uh, uh, you know, pretending that everything is just pure love and light and nobody fights. Uh, it's, it's not about that. The main difference between uh, divine union and uh, full on uh, uh, painful relationships is how much you take things personally. At the stage of relationships, you take everything personally. Everything you feel is directed to you is against you. Uh, against you or your things, your needs are not met, or your something again is not uh, as it should be. You are not seen, valued, estimated. So there's a huge focus on yourself in relationships. 
and how this self is seen or not seen, um, valued or not valued. And that means the interpretation of events is very personal. And I'm telling, I'm stressing the word interpretation mm -hmm. because what we think is not what necessarily is. If you could see it from a theater kind of a director perspective, you would see how intricate the setups and situations are to make you experience certain things. But when you don't have that capacity of observer, you think it's all about you, it's all for you, and it's, uh, mm. it's very personal. Yeah. It's... In divine union, you, you, you understand it's not personal, it's, it's just the way to, to transform energy and to liberate yourself for a higher purpose. And nothing is personally uh, attacking to your personality because you have also lost the personality along the way. Yeah, actually, that is an important feature of this journey is that at first we really want to keep that what is me, who I am, what are my preferences. As the journey progresses, we tend to drop one by one what we used to call I and what I used to call my preference or something. And, uh, you know, we are just much more in, in, uh, in like surfing the way of life and uh, shedding what used to be the preferences. And it sometimes can be scary because what are we when we losing, when we start losing our preferences, except especially for men who are really attached somehow to you know this is me and this is you know this is what i want to be and all this losing one one by one of those strong preferences is so relaxing we start to actually allow for the divine to <laughs> guide us and and lead us as a surfer is led by the wave and uh and laugh about it and mm. uh you know, have a certain lightness, have a certain lightness and uh, not taking things too seriously actually helps to reduce time of sulking and time of uh, kind yeah. of sitting in, in, mm -hmm. uh, in hurts and, mm -hmm. uh, and all that. So now that we, we see these three stages of, uh, of relationship, mm -hmm. you can... Let me just add one more illustration illustration about that outside observer we can illustrate it as a theater play so when we are in a theater and deeply engrossed in what's happening in a theater then we are kind of thinking that it's a reality when we remember that we are an observer you know in, in movies when there is about the, uh, the the scary scene is about to happen we look down and see oh, okay this is my lap i'm not right there and that's when the actual observer says, oh, it's just a movie, okay, fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Frank, you're right. It's uh, easy to say and uh, not easy to do. How are you becoming observer when you're full on and you know, mm -hmm. because your emotions are banging uh, uh, on mm -hmm. all corners. So there's a, is a heightened state, a mix of injustice and, uh, mm -hmm. and failure. You know, it's a, it's a cock deadly lethal cocktail of emotions playing out when you're really in dense uh, vision of relationships so how do you observe yourself at that moment well probably you can't well i but... have an answer how you have an answer uh, what i just explained what happens in the movie that you come back and look into your lap when there's ab about to be some slaughtering scene in real life you plant the diamond of divine consciousness in your heart and when you plant it through your meditation and nurture it every day and actually understand that there is the divine consciousness really a diamond in the center of your heart you can go back to that diamond and say oh i'm super triggered right now it feels so awful but if at least part of your mind remembers to to remembers the diamond that's the first step towards it and say ah what i'm feeling might be really BS. It might be my small attachments to small things that happened to me in past lives or when I was a kid. And that diamond knows because diamond has the direct the connection to the divine. So just remembering is the first step, how you step out from the 
feeling of the this is too real. Mm -hmm. It's okay if you can't step out at the beginning, but uh, you can always remember that bringing yourself fully present already will calm emotions. Because you know what's happening? What, what gets uh, to the heights of triggers is the mind. There's nothing else. You know, probably what a big, big fight looks like, it's two people standing in the room and uh, shouting out uh, loud. That's what it is. But because the mind has uh, is holding all the picture, it looks like a big drama. But actually, on a physical level, two people are standing and shouting in the room. That's and, what it is. And the heart is pumping. You know, nobody is. Uh, you know, nobody has a knife in the hand. Uh, it's not or a they physically do. dramatic situation. They maybe need a little more <laughs> props, but it's all drama. So if we remember, it's all theater and drama, and now it needs to be all nice. Okay, well, you know, we we have. The neglected to observe our triggers to that point that we also have to use knives. So then maybe need we need a physical injury in order to kind of wake up, wake up and start observing our triggers. But the call is to look onto yourself and to finally understand those triggers and understand our literally our role that we are playing on a theater stage. So in that moment of heightened emotions just bringing it to the physical reality. So what is, if you ask yourself in the middle of the fight, what is, well, what is, I'm standing here with another person. That's, that is what is, yeah. Is there like death involved? No, is there, you know, what is involved is, uh, is, is horrible ideas, yeah. Of a loss script, or like a betrayal, uh, but none of it is really physical. If you bring it down to your body, you can find that it's not actually as dramatic as the mind like, you know, shows it to be. And that's the place from where you can start observing. So what is going on? Who, who said what exactly? And being factual about it. And if it takes more time to calm down and self-reflect later, then you know, with knowing how to withdraw without banging door or kind of shouting, and taking the time to, to really dwell in uh, the core message of the situation. So the one advice is really to don't take any decision while your nervous system is in overdrive. <laughs> it's really, you know, it can only lead to catastrophe. So whatever, you know, if you need to shout, shout. If you need to, uh, to bang the door, bang, but don't take any decisions. Because in that moment, if you would see what happens in the moment of conflict, it's not just two people standing. It's a roaring crowd on both sides of inner aspects and all mother, father uh, overlay, wounded ancestors. There are two uh, crowds fighting. Yeah? That are all clamoring for the vessel of your body to express through. So we can really always imagine that we are a vessel like, like a van and we have at least five to eight you know, different energy people uh, who represent my grandfather, my father, my mother, my village, my original culture, all wanting to express through your mouth and, 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 and hands. And they all have solutions. Imagine that you have a, a bunch of, you know, wounded crowd uh, offering you solutions in that moment. What could you do to the other person? So how efficient is that? So that drives your system to overload mm -hmm. and it's really not the moment mm -hmm. to announce anything or to claim anything or to stop anything because it's not quite you or your divine presence talking mm -hmm. in that moment at all. Mm -hmm. So if you can as much as stay present to your breath or to your heartbeat or whatever you know how to do in the moment and self-reflect a little later and not to claim anything or state anything in that state, it's already a big deal. And it will actually what it does, if you can even stop one argument in this conscious way, it actually um, dissipates the energy straight away. It dissipates and drops and there's no more because you, it, you have reached the purpose of uh, seeing clearly. So that's the ground where you can actually start self-reflecting and repairing mm -hmm. yeah so uh and uh write down that question uh sean 
or Danitsa. So that we uh, go to it later because now we are kind of uh, continuing the, the, the flow of the thought. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So these are the the uh, relationship stages, yeah. And uh, of course, at the stage of divine union, you won't have roaring crowd fighting, yeah, through two people. It will be, uh, it will be. Oh, I feel, uh, you know, I feel trigger. Okay, I feel the trigger. Let's see why do I feel it, and I deal with it myself. And if I need, I reach out to my partner and uh, ask him to hold the field. So that's as much of a fight as it becomes uh after but let's see so what what is the fundamental energy playing out in a relationship between man and woman let's say and any other person by the way so we'll just take man and woman because it's more kind of uh, intense there <laughs> Uh, you can walk away from easily from your neighbors, partner, you know, business partners and, and stuff. But, you know, sometimes partner is. <laughs> is there to stay a little yeah. longer. <laughs> and so, as David said, the wounded masculine um, and feminine. Yes, we all do have them wounded in some ways. So what is happening is these polarities that are disbalanced within ourselves that are actually seeking the counterpart to eventually balance them out so a strong masculine attracting weak uh, we like weak feminine etc so everybody is seeking to balance itself so if your own polarities are in uh, disbalance one or the other way your own nature is looking to create the situations to balance them out, yeah? And to bring exactly the opposite, to, to trigger you into repairing what's out of balance. And that's where you have to look at your individual polarities first. And the clue to those individual polarities is in the parents, of course. Uh, how, you know, we, we had a whole course about it and we can't go much in detail. You can uh, look back to the tea that we did about... Um, yeah, there is the, the tea that is called Meet the Parents in our, uh, on our YouTube channel. That's really uh, where we explain how in a very complex way, but once we understand it, it's not that complex. How the parents, we play their scripts all over again before we are able to remove their field. But because we don't know how those our inner polarities look, because like, where, how do you know where you, you look like, a, I look like a woman, where are my polarities? How do I know? The only way I can test what's the state of my inner masculine, for example, is by seeing what the outer masculine reflects back to me. So let's say if I have the uh, weak inner masculine, I would keep attracting weak, outer masculines like indecisive or flaky men or you know like like that so that i can see that ah this is a state of my inner masculine okay so let's do something about it so it's not entirely that the other person is who he is he becomes in a relationship um magnetized to what we need to see so that's why that explains how, but at the beginning it was not like that, but at the beginning he was doing everything. Like uh, a woman with a weak inner masculine would try to attract a strong masculine who would do everything for her, yeah? But even if you attract the strongest masculine, which is, you know, a little bit unlikely, uh, that masculine will kind of uh, fade out to match your weak masculine. Let's say a, a very entrepreneurial young man would suddenly start doing less, 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 start engaging less, 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 until reaching the state of the woman's inner, inner masculine to just hold the mirror. And the man has no idea why he's doing that, why he stopped doing what he stopped doing. So once you see that what you don't like in, and it's like, oh, like, how are you so flaky and non-engaging? Once you understand that that masculine outside is just showing where you need to fix it inside and you start kind of inflating that inner masculine and uh, 
um, bringing it back to life. Well, guess what? The outer masculine will suddenly wake up and become full of new ideas and, uh, you know, start doing and being as, as you know, per magic, uh, just suddenly something shifted and you don't know what. So that's the purpose of relationships is to, to have yeah. the, our inner state reflected yeah. in a perfectly uh, clear mirror for us to see where do we need to, um, yeah. to work on ourselves. So purpose of relationship, several uh, questions were around that are, I, I guess, twofold as we see it now. First part of it is to have a clear mirror in order to really prime ourselves to be our best. So to personal growth. really to, to go through the personal growth and to see where we need to work on. But the actual purpose of relationship is once that we have seen and healed our triggers, then it becomes like this superpower unit that can create miracles together. Because we are over healing, we have healed already, or we have healed most of what we had to heal. And now we can co-create amazing things together because any not more of our energy is being what you know invested in healing now it's invested in creating and then we can say oh my god well let's make a huge global project and make something in this world that doesn't exist fully supporting one another and that then the really the miracles of creation are possible you know basic creation of course is having a child together but having like a global project together would be another example that, for example, involves, you know, like raising consciousness of millions of people who are in, in, involved in that project. For example, anything that comes to your mind becomes possible because that core unit is primed to use even sexuality and to use every like very conscious thoughts and energetic uh, work to propel that project into the huge success. So yeah uh, the actual uh, purpose of relationships is to create miracles together exactly and and that's why uh you know we're like a battery with our plus and minus how do you know you cannot tell by looking at the battery if if it's full or or empty you, you don't know you have to put with another battery and uh, to see if it's working or not and only when you know, those pluses and minuses are put in the correct way, it creates electricity. So that's what we're all after. We're all after having our battery perfectly charged and, um, and functioning that goes together with another person's battery that's perfectly polarized and, and matching to create the spark and infinite amount of energy and, uh, and joy and love and whatever you want. But real creation starts there. So you can create out of your own balanced polarities and you can go pretty far with your personal um, kind of aligned inner masculine and feminine. It really can take you to amazing heights. But when you join another person who has the same, uh, literally everything is possible. Everything becomes possible because the energy multiplies, you know, exponentially. So that's that's the, the point of relationship is actually highlighting where your inner polarities are not in uh, in balance and actually clearly showing why and using the relationship as a as a lab as a as a lab good exactly as a, as a place where you can dissect in very detail and use whatever method you want to come to the self realization um and self-responsibility, like a, a, a beautiful conscious relationship will leave you always more complete after it ends or interrupts. You will always, always be more complete and more close to your uh, perfect inner balance. And just quickly to answer Marina's question, uh, until you heal, you will attract somebody, well, you will attract a person with whom it will be possible to heal these things, but it doesn't mean that with the same person later, you won't be able to create miracles together. So the point is 
when you open up for relationships that you understand that there is a part of it that there is work that and that both partners are actually willing to work on this together then there is this healthy base in which you know we can kind of enjoy in that healing work for each other because we are preparing ourselves for the phase of creating miracles so that's you know what we can want to call in our life somebody who will also be willing to look at their own inner triggers and do it on in the lab of a relationship like avia says yeah so in in that perspective if you if you imagine that uh, your relationship is a perfect uh, setting for a very very fast growth you would from the conscious perspective, you would go for the most triggering, most complicated, most inappropriate relationship that you can find, because that's where you will see the truth about yourself. There's nothing in your life that can happen that has nothing to do with you. It just doesn't work like that. So uh, when we hear, and one of the myths is that, uh, you know, the toxic relationship. But yeah, before we go into that one, let we forgot to mention, one of the crucial things because of this that we are sharing is that we must be fine with experiencing some uncomfort. Yeah, we cannot be pussies and say, you know, oh, it hurts or it's unpleasant and I'll run away from this. Actually, that, that uh, courage and endurance to sit in an uncomfortable situation until we fully understand it and process it is one of the key features here to forget about conformism because this conformism has brought us to this place that we are completely uh, dependent on just experiencing pleasure. So that uncomfortable situations, we can learn to accept them with a smile and understanding that they are bringing the lessons. So this is a key thing, mm -hmm. accept that there will be uncomfortable situations and accept to be sitting in them, connected to your inner diamond in your heart and asking inner diamond to show you, to understand what's actually happening while it's still uncomfortable. So not running away, but sitting in it, not distracting, not going to Facebook, whatever you like to do, not going to run, not moving to another country or to another partner, but sitting in the uncomfortable situation, connected to the inner diamond and exploring what's actually happening here. Mm -hmm. That's the shortcut. If you really want a fast forward uh, track to enlightenment, go with like whatever person stands there in front of you and say, okay, bring it on, <laughs> trigger me. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm fine, ready, yeah. bring it on, I'm fine. Because you are, you know why you're doing this and you are aware that all the triggers are yours. So you will go through every single one of them until you are untriggerable, you know? until you have no more buttons left to, to, to push. And after that mm -hmm. fast track, you will say, wow, is there all it was to that? Yeah, was it was so it that awful? That yeah. I was trying to avoid all my life? Because mm -hmm. unfortunately we're creatures of, uh, you know, going for our likes and dislikes. And every, every choice we make is I like, I don't like, I like, I don't like, and we heavily privilege the things we like. And it's okay. But sometimes the don't like is, is the shortcut to, uh, to our greatest talents and, and, uh, and depths. So we have to keep that in mind. And of course, we are free to choose a, a, a slower path or easier path, and they're all OK. Mm -hmm. uh, just the mechanics is such that the more person triggers us, the higher is the potential for a breakthrough and faster. So um, there's one particular case where uh, people who are single and I, I can, for example, uh, Zane, I will, I will use your, your case because it's really, it, 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 it felt so amazing when we found it uh, and it explains so, so much that sometimes people just don't get to the relationship and there's a reason for that because the triggers that they have, for example, in, in, uh, in some case like Zane, it would be uh, the extreme trigger about justice, about things having to be fair and just and, uh, you know, right. 
together with a wound of betrayal. Well, imagine if, if that is what the man would project on, on her. She would attract a man who would horribly, unjustly betray her just to show the lesson. And it can be so horribly unjust that uh, she would not be able to even figure out the lesson because it would be just too painful. So that's part of the answer to Marina's question, when am I ready? So uh, sometimes it's too early because it will be such a huge discrepancy between the person and those uh, triggers that get uh, triggered that it is overwhelmingly hard. So mm -hmm. we are ready you at the least. Point. <laughs> yes. The trigger misses the point because you're lost in pain, actually, and, and takes, you know, then many, many years to kind of rewind it back and heal. So, so sometimes it's yeah. a, the soul has chosen in saying uh, we cannot allow this person to have the mirror from another, from another like a romantic relationship because she might not survive it. Yeah. So when so, we are ready is when we have this muscle of inner transformation to some level developed so that we are not expecting everything to be a little butterflies but we know that there's going to be some work involved and that we are fine with certain level of, you know, just being in the cold water while we learn how to surf. So those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. When you are there, then it doesn't even need to be so, uh, so, so, so hugely triggering. It could be, okay, we know we have some work to do. Let's, let's go for it. And and we, we have to figure out what is our core uh, wounds anyways. Exactly. And when we know the core wounds and we look, okay, how would those core wounds look on another person? Oh no, I cannot, <laughs> I am not ready for that. Yeah, so like uh, Hannah, for example, you can see the situation a little bit, uh, your sister is playing out what uh, you, know, you could have had for yourself. And sometimes it involves this uh, complexity of having the child in the middle. And if your path is more than that, th this whole healing through the relationship is put on hold and you do it in a different way, uh, in something that's uh, safer and uh, less nerve wrenching So when we do uh, choose to, to grow through, um, through relationships, so the first myth is, uh, I am calling in the one. Yeah, well, as soon as we're 16, we're calling in the one. And we have a clear idea of what the perfect person should look like. The right be, person. Yeah, the yeah. right person. So very enthusiastically, we have lists of, uh, of uh, you know, what they need to be. Um, that's actually where <laughs> the, the, the problem starts. As soon as you have the list, first of all, well, you have to be all that on that list. And second of all, if you do have a list, if you even come up with a list, it means that uh, yeah. you, are, you are filtering out already a trigger-free person. So you can look at the list of what you want the man or the woman to be and you can say, okay, this, what I, this is what I will have to work on. So Every you have single really point of that listed down what you need to work on yourself. And when we say I'm attracting, calling in the right person who mm -hmm. will accept me as I am, what you are really saying is I'm accepting, I'm calling in the person who will not challenge me and who will slalom between my triggers. So it will be a trigger slalom person. So he will not. Uh, or she will not touch my sensitive uh, points, so I will not have to work. So mm -hmm. that's what we are saying. And if he touches my trigger points, I will be out. And mm -hmm. you know, so basically, when you have a list of the ideal partner, you might actually get exactly what you're asking for, but you will not feel the way you thought you will feel with the person from that list. Because actually he will, if you call a man that's kind of serious and um, committed and uh, loving and all that. And if that man actually comes and you are not there yet, a series of events 
will squeeze you into you becoming serious, you becoming committed, you becoming all that you Whatever want to, was really noticed, want to yeah. be. And it might not come in a form of how you expected. You wanted a serious man and he can be making you feel kind of chained down, pinned down and over, over serious. So we have to be very, very careful when we give universe uh, directions, because if universe delivers you exactly what you ask for, then you have to be ready to work with that that you have chosen. Mm -hmm. I would say it's safer. You can consider that any person coming your way is the right person. When you enter this relationship with awareness of what is the work to be done there and what is the fun that you can actually have while imagine like going with someone that you know is not going to be easy. Like, uh, you know, we're quite an example for that because uh, Gemini and, and Scorpio, Scorpio are can the imagine. most incompatible uh, signs of the whole zodiac. And they are triggering each other in those like, oh, the, the core cert certainties. Yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, it's absolutely, you know, you can't imagine uh, amount of nerve nervous connections that need to be uh, recreated for that purpose. But actually what stands at the end of an extremely challenging um, uh, relationship when it's conscious, it's extreme amounts of inner freedom. You become free of your own criteria. Mm. Oh, yeah. You become free of your own needs and wants and of your ways own of cage doing. of your own preferences. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, that's uh, that's the freedom on deeper level. Then somebody freeing you from something outside. This is your being freed from your own cage of your own personal preferences. So in a way, the ideal partner is as opposite to you as it can be, because it stretches you and it invites, invites you in uncharted territories because they if don't your cater goal for, is, they, yeah. they don't yeah. fulfill your needs. Yeah. They don't go your way because they just don't know how to, but they're holding the door where you have never been and holding a, a pure and empty field where you haven't yet been because you've carefully avoided ever going there. It's not easy. I can't but say that breaking through would be easy, but it's so much fun because every step that you uh, walk in uncharted territory is is a huge huge inner victory and a tremendous amount of inner freedom so this was the first myth yeah calling in the right partner let's go yeah to so some of the other ones calling the right partner then uh, also implies that you have the second myth of your needs so you're not only having the list of what the person needs mm -hmm. to be so the myth is my needs are not met or my need, my needs yeah. need to be met. Yeah, but many people are going around with a list of their needs and uh, like a Christmas list or mm -hmm. like shopping list and, and they are asking basically the other person, so how many of these boxes you can tick off for me? Mm -hmm. Like do this work for me. Like, uh, can you provide me the security, safety, loving arms, uh, breakfast in the morning and being heard, seen, felt, understood, uh, cherished and accepted just the way I am. Yeah. So it's quite a list of uh, things that we are asking uh, and we are calling them lovingly our needs. And we're plus it's uh, somehow entering the mainstream uh, thinking that those needs are so special and you have to stand for them. You have to respect them. You have to kind of uh, put a weight on them, that it's your uh, legitimate need. And it comes from a reaction of uh, those needs being completely overlooked and suppressed for the past centuries. So now it's somehow gaining momentum of uh, everybody's needs mm -hmm. that need to be respected and met and boundaries yeah. and whatnot. I would argue that needs as such don't exist. When we are calling something our need, we are really claiming our victim situation towards that topic. So if this is my need, it means that I'm lacking this and it means that I'm accepting this state of lack rather than why would I, if you, if you say this is your need, why is it your need? Well, have it fulfilled. 
It's, it's your work to have it fulfilled and not call it a need, but call it as a joyful creation with the universe. So I'm choosing to go in the direction that I call my need and fulfilling it. So if you call it to need, this is willful uh, holding on to the state of lack. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, you know, it's in spite that it's very popular and uh, we might sound very unpopular uh, as a matter of fact, uh, by diminishing the importance of one's personal needs, you have to see it in the light of what do you actually get out of having your needs met? Is there evolution in that? And is it fair to put uh, so much pressure on one single person to fulfill those needs? Yeah. So most of you probably are not in that stage anymore, but, uh, but just in more subtle ways, always examine, are you uh, asking the other person to be your everything? Sometimes we see on Facebook, thank you, my love, my sister, my, my mother, my <laughs> partner, my mother of my kids, you know, and the list goes on and on and on of what the person is for the other. Well, it's, uh, it's fantastic, but it's not a rule. The other person does not have to be your everything. It's not a proof of love. It's not a measure of love. It's not a measure of commitment or a success in a relationship if you are ev the other person's everything. You do not have to be, nor is it expected on, uh, nor it, it can be expected on the other side. So don't put pressure on one person to fulfill a, a list of needs and to be there the shoulder to cry on to to see you to hear you uh, you can reach out to to you know women's circles if you need to to be heard because the man you know your beautiful man is just maybe not you know he doesn't have capacity to hear you the way you want to be heard so respecting that the other person can do only as much as he can and not forcing them to fulfill more than they actually are capable of and being very clear about it. If you do have a need, you can put it out there and say, well, well I need hugs in the morning. Well, I do need hugs in the morning. Like and it's uh, not even, we have to kind of, you know, it's-, it's But you want to call it a need or you just say, I like hugs in the morning, yeah. you know? We don't even have to use the word need, you know? It's like uh, literally very disempowering calling something a need. And, you know, the other person say, you know, I need time by myself. So it's not a needy need. It's a, it's a way of functioning, actually. It's the way the other person functions. One is, you know, needs to touch everything all the time, like me. The other one needs to hear things. And those needs are actually the ways of communication. And we need Preference to, or preferences. Or we need to understand them and uh, respect them. If I, if I communicate, if I feel that I'm not loved because, you know, I'm not hugged, mm -hmm. Uh, well, I also need to understand that other person might not feel love because he doesn't hear anything about it. So really establishing, uh, yeah, the, the, exactly the, the, the love languages, like how do you, what's your preferred way of being loved? How do you understand that you're loved? And respecting that our way might not be the other's way and uh, being very clear and fluid in communication and not putting the neediness on the need, mm -hmm. but just stating it openly and clearly and uh, you know, whatever comes back, comes back, it's cool. But uh, never putting the pressure on the other person to fulfill any need. Mm -hmm. It gives enough freedom for the other person to actually, you know, he might show up and fulfill the whole list if there is any. Mm -hmm. The question that is coming up already for the second time is attraction. So uh, do we, should we follow the attraction? And uh, Anna asks, are we even able to feel a strong attraction to someone if we are uh, going this way? So strong attraction, I don't know if this was in our list of myths, but strong attraction is really we have to understand why is there strong attraction? We have seen that this can be a huge trap in starting a relationship if you go to something that is a strong attraction. Yeah, a physical attraction. Yeah, strong physical attraction. But I will talk about the other kind of attraction. Mm -hmm. um, maybe first I will explain this, you know, kind of you're attracted to the person and Vittori mm -hmm. will explain the physical part of okay. it. So 
strong attraction and we join in the soulmates and twin flames and everything in that um, in that picture the strong attraction is actually the soul's contract making sure that you you know you have agreed before that you this lifetime you have to solve this problem you cannot put it on for a next and next and next so there needs to be a strong attraction that binds people together magnetize in a situation to work out a certain dynamics or a wound so strong attraction always includes strong experience that goes behind it and when we don't like the quality of that experience because we judge it as you know bad or um, unhealthy or harmful or hurtful well we're right in it if we can just follow that strong attraction and you know kind of walk in full faith in a strong attraction relationship and go for okay i'm going for my lesson let's see what this person has to bring me and then oh i feel hurt because you know he's uh, he's not committed and going down and examining what is the person bringing you consciously kind of taking responsibility and going down it then you can imagine you will minimize the unpleasant part of it and you will enjoy what the other part that the tremendous attraction can bring which is you know crazy levels of inspiration and uh, and uplifting and joy and fun and everything so you are the only one who makes the painful part heavy or long or big by not wanting to see it. If you would be constructive about it, you know, we have managed to reduce our unpleasantness parts to a few hours or maybe within an hour. Now we're really so, good at it. <laughs> so it after an hour, we can laugh about it or sometimes yeah. even immediately. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we can laugh while we're in the trigger. Mm -hmm. So the shorter you make the process of kind of uh, marinating the problem, the more time you have to have fun. Yeah. So strong attraction means you're heading for uh, for a lesson. If you know that you're heading for the lesson and dutifully kind of look at it, uh, the rest is is coming with uh, the rest is benefits of the strong uh, attraction. So. You, you have to follow the strong attraction in a way that there is something. It might not be for the lifetime, you know, don't project what it means before mm -hmm. you actually see what it means. But there is something for you. And strong attraction is an indicator that the person has a little package for you. You know, what's in it, you'll only see when you unwrap. <laughs> and take it with gratitude, you know, when you can take all the packages with gratitude from anyone in your life. I mean, already God gives you more grace to handle it. It will be, you'll handle it in the right moment, in the right way, with not too much drama. Like we're solving our problems here with a big majestic sea view, nothing bad happening. We go for lunch right after. So it gets easier and easier when you like include gratitude. And then when there's a strong, uh, and soulmates actually, well, that's that. It means that you will have a huge amount of bliss, but together with amount of work to do. And you cannot separate one from the other. You, you have to take the package. You have to take the bliss and being, you know, in huge amounts of love together with uh, what else comes, comes there, together with the work to be done. Because what is the point? The point is personal growth. So why not just go for it? Yeah, mm. that's what the consciousness part in the relationship is about. And, and then the physical, the physical part of attraction, that's another thing. So what I wanted to say that the psychological attraction um, is, you know, more or less a mystical past life and other kind of energetic condition. But the physical attraction has its own set of rules and that's where mm -hmm. I would really invite you to be very careful. Yeah, uh, so sexuality is this huge potential generator or energy that we have, perhaps the strongest one that we do have. So there is all bunch of unseen interests that are trying to compete for that energy that we are creating through sexuality. And uh, in 
to, I won't get too much into what are the forces that are included in that you know waiting list. Who wants to get a piece of that energy? But just sexualizing the culture, over sexualizing the culture, and like using this uh, this day and age that we are kind of free to experiment in sexuality has have some hooks attached. So our you know, we are exposed to over-sexualized uh, commercials, uh, videos, we, wherever we look, their sexuality, so that we kind of start really depending so much on sexual attraction. So if we start the relationship from sexual attraction is a huge trap because it's really not a good enough reason to start a relationship. If we are sexually attracted to someone and we start with that first, then the entity that is actually formed around our sexual attraction starts to lead where the, the relationship goes. The way that it works is I'm sexually attracted to someone, I engage immediately into sexuality with them, and now I'm actually attached to the physical pleasure of actually having a sexual uh, contact with this person. And then the actual work that we need to do is kind of suffering because what I want is to keep this, you know, I'm starting to be attached to the sexuality with this person. If this is what it, it started, I'm almost like looking for excuses. What else am I here for? Because I want to maintain the sexuality that already started to form itself. So it's strongly suggested for all of us to never start the relationship with engaging in sexuality. It should be the last thing that happens that we have established already that the souls have some work to do together where we have already kind of understood why this person is there in our life and only then opening up to actually adding this, this, uh, this dimension. Otherwise we are, you know, there is this huge energetic, I call it a sexual entity or sexual demon that will actually lead us to where the, the relationship is going to go. So I think in shortest terms, this is how I, without going into really explanation of what are the forces attached to this. Yeah, it's it's another set of energies that you can't really trust and it's uh, it comes in parallel and it you know, navigate through relationships, but, you know, using this energy that's produced in the middle. So you cannot trust only that as an mm -hmm. indicator of, uh, of, of yeah. getting uh, Be because together. Because yeah? sexuality has super important purpose. It has a purpose to really empower all of your creations together when it's, when it's conducted in a specific way and with the way of knowing how to direct this energy. So it's really, you know, we don't know how to use sexuality. We have been misguided by the culture in only looking for pleasure in it. But there is so much more, and this is a key to that superpower that we can create magical things, but only if you know how to use and apply sexuality in correct way. And it's otherwise huge drain. We are feeding all that, including pornography industry, including, you know, like, uh, uh, lower astral fantasies that we might have. We are feeding other, uh, other entities instead of actually getting this energy, uh, creating it almost in a power plant that we have. Sexuality, conscious sexuality is huge power plant where we can generate amazing amounts of energy and then directing it towards the creation of something that we want to uh, creating in our lives those amazing mm -hmm. projects and these miracles mm -hmm. uh, and that becomes available when both at only at certain stage where both have taken this emotional responsibility and are not uh, trying to prove or compensate or adjust or adapt but when sexuality becomes a very natural and spontaneous exchange between two people that energy that has an intelligence of its own as long as it directed by mind it doesn't work it works for other purposes of pleasure and 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 etc. But when it's driven from a, a really really pure space and um, 
conducted in a in a certain way. So you know, it's another course in itself mm -hmm. how how that part works. But uh, you you have to trust that uh, mm, lustful thoughts usually include some little greedy uh, hands behind them. Yeah. So so don't trust that energy and double check with your all your instincts and antennas. So what is it really telling? What's a strong sexual attraction has behind? And if that's how you enter a relationship, really observe, is it true, truly a relationship for growth or you've been in a little trap of, uh, you know, of these lower agendas? Mm -hmm. So anyways, let's move on to, yeah. uh, to uh, Beatrice suggests the next uh, myth. Uh, what if... What if uh, what if uh, the other person is on a different stage than uh, mm -hmm. than you mm -hmm. in the relationship or spiritual journey and that's a big 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 myth it's always like uh, is my partner slowing me down in my spiritual journey is my partner uh, kind of slowing my expansion we hear it over and over and over again that my partner is somehow kind of uh, not supporting me or or being against what i do or mm -hmm. not giving me enough space so it's it just keeps coming over well the answer is very is very clear that um, you're responsible only for your part of the journey you're not responsible to bring anyone on your back to anywhere else and believe me, the, the basic law of energy in a relationship is like this. If you do your part of development, when you have outgrown a certain stage and you are becoming too much for the other person and they don't want, they're not ready, they don't want to follow there, their subconscious will start attacking you and two things can happen. They, it's just in a, in a, for self-protecting reasons that their subconscious will attack you. Same for family members who don't share your views. They're kind of attacking you because they just want you out of the picture because you're the bringer of too much new things. So you have to take it just like that. If you are a less um, evolving person, um, kind of projects anything on you and, and you know starts kind of, binding you down uh, in some ways you have to understand that maybe it is really too much for him or for her and in that case uh, his subconscious will somehow kick you out of the picture by breaking up with you but it will always come from there or you will be uh, attracted somewhere else and you have to trust that there's again nothing personal in uh, inception exactly inception is a is a perfect movie to to show how the person's protective mechanism comes and kills the intruder who is bringing too much of new things when the other one is not ready for that so you can trust that when you are evolving you're responsible for your journey and if that is what the other person can handle they will evolve on almost easier because you have done the groundwork and it will come like you you go step forward and they somehow catch up you get get another step forward they catch up if they can't don't insist it can actually break their health they can break their business they can break a lot of things in their life yeah. don't insist to drag anyone forward but watch for the signs when their subconscious is starting to attack you and kind of, uh, you know, kick you out or put you aside. I need a time off. I need time to think. We have to think our relationship over. You know, Bella, I'm thinking about you. If, uh, if, uh, <laughs> if your husband, it's, if the space and um, some people need really more time to integrate and process information. So if it's too fast, they would just create a space between the source of these new, too much new things and themselves so that is a sign they actually need to take it slower and you have to respect it if you care about the person enough to kind of keep going and wait for them to catch up you can but um, ultimately if you really want a dynamic exchange it's better that you find a partner who has the same speed of uh, 
well, processing. It's, just, it's you know? about willingness. You know, the speed gets it. I always use the uh, parallel of the surfer with the wave. You know, I cannot want to go slower than the wave goes. So if the wave of change in our partnership goes on this speed, well, you know, I either go with it or I decide to abandon this wave. You know, there is, we can, but if the other, if both people are really committed to the inner growth, then it's not a problem. We say, okay, well, we adjust to the speed of the wave and we ride the wave together. Yeah, so again, not taking it personally. Nobody is trying to stop your expansion and nobody is trying to kind of clip your wings in any ways. It's, uh, it's you misinterpreting their cry for help because they cannot voice it out. They don't know what it is really. They are trying to say, stop flooding me with new ideas. I haven't caught up with the previous ones, you know, like stop, stop dragging me uh, head over also heels into the new zone. where yeah. I haven't been stabilized in the previous stages. And super, super respect for everybody's speed of going mm -hmm. through a personal development. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so then that brings us to the next myth of uh, when you have been um, what is it called give it a like title toxic relationship yes when you have been a kind of speeding towards your expansion and uh, independence and everything then suddenly uh, you find yourself maybe in this what is now popular to call toxic relationship where it actually becomes unbearable like you've been bullied or or the person is attacking you i'm thinking about anne here uh, that when the other person clearly exhibits signs of hostility, humiliation, bullying, overpowering, it means they are totally not able to catch up with the speed of events. They are trying to lower the vibration at all costs so that they can survive within relationship. They cannot voice it out. So it looks like they're trying to, to bully uh, you in in some lower expression but they are just saying stop it stop it for a moment i cannot handle your kind of expansion uh, any longer so this is where you know a healthy break is uh, is actually a good idea this is one scenario and of when to we, toxic relationship and when we say a break we mean break like putting uh, the handbrake <laughs> <Can> on <laughs> you you don't break things. You just put everything on breaks so that, you know, the other person has a time to catch up, you know, to catch the breath and understand what's going on. Um, if that period of, uh, of breaks uh, actually teaches that, uh, you know, one side will not be ready, you're ready to go on and, and the other one is not ready to, to evolve, well, then you act accordingly, but you do not ever break anything. Because if you break out of relationship, then something really breaks. It's an unfinished process, mm -hmm. unfinished energy. And it will linger on. There'll be these coming, breaking up, coming back, breaking up, coming back. And, you know, mm -hmm. dramatic phone calls, uh, suicide notes, uh, etc. Because if you break something that's not ready to be finished yet, you're dealing with troubling consequences on both sides. Yeah, one more um kind of rule of thumb that we have discovered is, you know, when is the relationship ready to be finished? Relationship is ready to be finished when we have this inner calmness about the idea that this cycle is over and I'm ready to step out of it. Mm -hmm. If there is no inner calmness, if there is this agi inner agitation of and breaking something. questions and needs to break out, it means that some of the lessons have not been processed. It yeah. means that uh, you still have some work to do. So, so relationship is uh, dissolving by itself when you have exhausted the triggers that you could work on together. And as long as you have not, it's escaping from a well kind of set plan. And sometimes people do make sure that they it's not easy to escape, you know, children, businesses, house, uh, mortgage, whatever. If you have that kind of setup where you where you really cannot break it so easily, that means there's a reason why you created that way, why you created a, a huge 
uh, like monumental bolted uh, structure so that you cannot easily break out of it. That means that your soul has committed to learn the lessons. And when those lessons are learned, believe me, all the bolts just pop open and the situation dissolves in fluidity, um, um, you know, very, very spontaneously and easy and you don't have to break anything. It opens by itself when uh, the lesson has been learned and all the energy that held people together is exhausted. So it goes also for your side, for the other person's side, but in general, when everything in relationship responds to your energy, whichever part is you, it's only you, yeah? And the other person uh, is magnetized, repelled or attracted to that which, mm -hmm. what is you. What um, about toxic relationship between uh, in, in family, like between relatives? Uh, we didn't talk about, we didn't say that uh, you, should, you need to break up outside of toxic relationship. We said that we have, you have to understand why it is there. Yeah. And then if you are at peace with that understanding, you can walk away out of it, but not like breaking out before you have understood what is trying to tell you. So when it comes, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you can cover about uh, connection with, with, between relatives and family. So it's a group of people that again have come together to explore some topic which might be injustice or uh, betrayal you know the very famous topics usually it all revolves uh, under five core wounds and there are not much surprises in that so if you are stuck in uh, with family members that means maybe you didn't have a partner who would poke you in that so you have a family member fulfilling that duty so Again and again, self-responsibility and understanding that it's your business. And when you will um, understand what you need to understand, it will just drift out of your life. I had, I had a situation like this, like unbearable uh, combination of, uh, of a person that I had to include in my life, you know, like partners, uh, ex-partner's daughter yeah you cannot really kind of <laughs> cut her out of the picture she's the unbearable annoying in every possible way and i just i was stuck with that unbearable person face to face until i understood what i needed to understand and then all of a sudden she moved to another country and never to be seen again so it does work uh, that when you take responsibility of not escaping the lesson, but facing it, actually you have all the needed help to integrate it. The moment that you decide, no, I'm not gonna run away as, as I usually do, but I'm gonna face it. Suddenly there's a book, there's a talk, there's a advice, there's a friend, there's a method, there's a course, there is something streaming in to help you see. You are not by yourself, you don't have to, you don't have to kind of deal with it on your own. The universe is just asking for your willingness to, you know, to face it basically. Yeah? So yeah, don't escape your triggers, sit through them, embrace them, be grateful and uh, work through. That's your shortcut, ultimate shortcut through life in general. And uh, well, we don't have much time left, but uh, we, we would still need to give you those little tools and recipes on how to do it. We Did still we go have... through all of them? No, we oh. didn't because it's, uh, it's really, it's, it's, you know, a little bit complex about commitment and... Uh, Let's and quickly go and cover them at least in, a, you know, so, so yeah. that all of them are there. Um, but first let's see the conscious uh, fighting uh, part yeah so that mm -hmm. we don't uh, skip on that mm -hmm. the the conscious fighting is uh, you know basically disagreement of uh, of two people's ideas so what we usually do in more unconscious uh, stages of of ourselves is that we feel personally attacked and disrespected with any uh, thought that goes against how we like it to be. So which are in instantly ignites the power of emotions that are associated to, this, to that situation. And uh, 
And then we start projecting and we want to fight back and we want to make the other person feel the way we do. Like if we feel hurt, then we are trying to kind of like a wasp, trying to find how to bite back, you know, how to sting back. So that's usually how the fight creates and then it escalates. And believe me or not, but I'm always telling my clients, remember that your last fight with your partner was also your first fight. There are no surprises there. We're not that original. We don't fight about million things. We fight essentially about one, two, maximum three topics. So if you examine your last fight, you can trace it back that this is also how you started. There's a fundamental disagreement on something and it comes back in various forms and shapes and just gains in more and more energy. So it's, yeah, it's, it's about seeing where does this fight point to and what is the trigger that you still haven't seen in yourself and, and, and heal. Always that. So fight is there because, you know, it's something that is repeating itself and it's kind of raising pressure. So finally that you see from where it comes. Yeah, the, so, the commitment talk is a perfect, uh, is a perfect uh, field yeah. for, uh, for, uh, for a fight because it's very, you know, oh. <clears throat> commitment it's, is our next uh, uh, myth. myth, so. But let's see what to do, you know? So you have two mm. conflicting opinions and uh, you've been triggered. What, you, what means trigger? Literally trigger as the word itself says, the button has been pushed. And it feels super unpleasant. So the, so the coffee isn't making, you know? Mm. The button has been pushed. <laughs> the certain the, kind the water of- water is heating. <laughs> water <Yeah>. is heating. <laughs> And, and the product is being made, you know, one and the same. It's, you know, if you push on cafe latte, cafe latte will you get. And you have maybe 10 buttons like this and it always goes in the same, uh, in the same direction. So button has, trigger has been pushed. You feel the water boiling. The product is coming into existence. So in that moment, however much presence you can gather, you can, maybe by automatically shoot back something, you know, shoot back your usual uh, with how, how you do it. But if you at any stage of that emotional excess, you can, if you can realize that you're being emotional, then you know that you have to release the emotions, breathe them out, you know, just breathe them out. Don't act upon them, breathe them out. And the second thing, you point out, out to yourself, well, who is the one triggered? It's usually not both. It's one that gets triggered. So the one who feels the feelings is the one who needs to solve them. And you can always check in the situation. For example, if we, if we have a disagreement, you know, sometimes I don't know what did I say? Uh, so why the other one is suddenly all over the place? So what, what did I say different than usual? And he's like, oh, but, say, but you're the one feeling it. So you're welcome so the one to, feeling it to is solve it. Really uh, the one who needs to look at it and solve it. Exactly. Yeah. If it's happening at the same time, then both of them have to look why am I triggered and I need to solve it. It's not pointing finger out. It's pointing finger in. Yeah. So if you can do that much and at least for one time, wake up in the middle of the fight and ask, so who is the one feeling? I'm the one feeling. So whose problem is it? My problem, because I'm the one feeling it. So, and also giving that responsibility lovingly to the other one, well, darling, you're the one feeling it. Uh, hello, uh, your monsters, your problem, uh, you solve it. And I'm here to help you if you need, yeah? So being lucid about whose emotion, whose responsibility to solve it, and being there to help, you know, if you want to look at it, I'm here, you know, I have my charts and, uh, you know, we can solve it. And usually it's, it's, it's from, from a senseless fight and burst of emotions, it becomes in a creative step forward and huge liberation because also fights, you have to trust that they come in a divinely perfect moment. If a fight comes, that means that's the moment to solve it, not 10 years later. That means that stars are in the, in the right position, everything is there. You just have to nail it right then and there and act upon it consciously. So then owning- It's the easiest that, moment to solve it. Owning that emotion is the step number one. Then give those other steps if you want how to, how to 
release the pressure. Owning emotion, taking emotional responsibility to yourself and not projecting to, to the other one. Third, recognizing what it is that you're feeling and self-reflecting with any tools that you know how to, to, to dig down to the core and deciding that this is the last time this trigger actually is alive in your life and that you commit yourself to really digging to the core of it and asking all the help from the partner, universe, friends, anyone, facilitators, facilitators well. to really drill down because now is the time, now is the best time it has come up, it has a reason why it came up, and when it comes up is the best time to solve it. Don't put it for the next kind of cycle of moon or whatever time when it will come back again. Uh, and when it comes around the commitment uh, issues, yeah, you, you have so to... Commitment is another myth that we wanted to cover mm -hmm. because we need to understand what it really means. Commitment is last century. <laughs> notion commitment is actually what you're asking when you are wanting people to be committed you are asking for your own peace of mind not more than that ponder on it and you will understand that commitment when you need the other person to commit you want to secure your own mental space so that your mind can relax and kind of project the future and plant events in the future it so has nothing i want to do future with to be as it is now and i want to be to have comfort of knowing that the future is not unpredictable so it's almost like you know it's asking it's it's projecting to the future this is the usual meaning of what we mean by commitment mind mind cannot survive in uncertainty mind is not designed mind needs a structure it needs a name it needs something to cling on i'm married i'm single i'm a relationship it's my friend it's my partner it needs some definition and it you know it has its little hands trembling when it doesn't cannot qualify something are we in relationship yes or no tell me now uh are we going to stay together well i want to know like otherwise i will go you know who or or you, am I wasting my time investing? Am in I investing in, 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 so, in vain? Yeah. So this commitment is a big, big deal. And the trust that comes with it and possibility of betrayal, everything in your mind. You cannot trust because you don't know if the person will, you know, be there in your picture for long enough. You cannot trust because you don't know if uh, your mental picture of you two together will be shattered by someone else how horrible so in that moment of uncertainty about commitment and trust and what will happen and will i be betrayed and everything you have to accept one simple simple thing yes you might be betrayed and all of that that you're afraid well, of first thing to understand is the only thing that exists is the present moment that's like yeah. the first thing to understand mm -hmm. And, and then? yeah, and, and when you bring it to the present moment, so are you committed to the today? Well, yes, you are committed. Is the person committed to you today? Yes, he is. So do you need the mental commitment in a complete uncertainty uh, with no guarantee that it will ever happen? Um, your mind might need it, but it creates too many, it takes you away from actually the beauty of the moment and what you can do together and what you can explore together in this state right now. Yeah, but what about children? I need, I need to know, I need to plan, where do I live? Well, everything comes in its own time. You do not have to plan things ahead uh mm -hmm. especially by avoiding things you don't want to see in your picture so don't ask anyone to to um, conform to your mental picture of what the relationship might look like so, sit in your anxiety and yeah. understand that divine perfection is can bring you to much more than you can ever think of so the great question about it is what would i do differently, differently? if this relationship is to last the next 10 years versus next one year versus one week and versus uh, till the end of the day. 
So is there something in this moment that I would do differently? It's an interesting exercise to actually appreciate the value of this moment. And when you take it to what is really right now and put all your appreciation to this, then the other person also will feel valued, estimated for what it brings in your life and uh, everything will take a different color. So if you get, can get the mind out of your way and, uh, and just bring it to this uh, statement that if, if you feel that you will lose something by you know, doing it or it will be, or it's a sacrifice and then in that case, just don't do it. Do what feels comfortable, put in relationship what you're ready to lose if it ends in two days. And uh, we're a little bit of uh, pioneers in this uh, moment to moment existence because we have been taking it day by day. It has ended up in, uh, in four years today. And uh, four years of day by day, of pearls. Has... But uh, the question about commitment is that there is one commitment. The commitment is to our inner coming closer to the inner divine. So that's the only one commitment that we can have. Commitment is to coming closer to expressing in this world as a divine being, as many moments in this day as possible. So that's the only possible commitment that actually makes some sense. And if we have two people- And if we can do it together, well, yes. that's fantastic, you know? And, and that's the hugest value to be able to commit to oneself individually and see the other one committed to the same thing on the other end and just, you know, keep going and poking and pushing and hugging and, uh, and, uh, and loving each other through those moments of individual self-development. And that's basically all there is. Your, your journey for yourself together with the other and, uh, you know, sometimes day by day can take you to great length. And if it doesn't, then it's fine too, you know. Uh, that's the, the commitment to yourself and your evolution of your soul. Um, and sharing can be double trouble or double pleasure, or sometimes both. So, so I guess uh, this is where we need to stop because have, have we covered all or we have this one more? of true love. Yeah, so is it true love? You know, is it true love? Uh, like we could ask ourselves, well, do we have true love? And then we have to laugh about it. So the true love is when you truly love and estimate yourself, your connection to divine, and together it creates the atmosphere where other people can be included. And true love is how empty you are of yourself and filled with the universal love. That's the only true love you can ever bring in this world is the divine love in a human form. Yeah, it has nothing to do with romantic ideas of, uh, of doing <laughs> everything together. Although we love, we love doing everything together. We love shopping together, you know, every little detail together. And sometimes but it's a we consequence, don't. yeah, of... Uh or other things it's like not a goal in itself yeah so when nothing is a goal in itself but you enjoy and you ask every moment so do i still feel like going uh, and shopping hand in hand with this man well yes i do so then i do <laughs> and the moment i don't it's fine too yeah so uh, being in constant mm -hmm. flux and evolution and never taking anything personally never blaming anyone for anything but taking responsibility and emotional responsibility for your own journey is the, the, the guarantee to spiritual evolution. It's not guarantee for happiness, comfort, or well-being. It's a guarantee for what you have come here to do is to explore, explore your maximum human potential. And, uh, you know, together we can do it faster. <laughs> faster and funner. And funner. <laughs> Yeah.
So uh, that's how much we can squeeze in today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had a little bit. There's much more. Yeah. There's much more. There's mo much more, you know, like uh, juicy details. We just were limited by time, but. Uh, we might revisit if you guys want and kind of go a little in yeah. more in the detail. Well, as a matter of fact, like Bella has uh, mentioned, we might actually expand this into some sort of a longer, maybe maybe course or something like this, where we will discuss where everyone is in their personal journey compared to what we have uh, covered here. Yeah, and how to reach this ultimate freedom while being uh, with one person, 10, 20, uh, all whole humanity. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, gifting you a, a bit of a result of our common daily work of four years straight. I think in number of hours that have, we have spent with each other and within the personal development, we mm -hmm. have been together for 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> in, in, intensive, intense in, wise, in, yeah. Intensity, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, so um, that also counts. So um, really willing to transmit you any bit of this mm -hmm. transformed energy and if there are possible. some questions that we haven't covered uh put the question in the telegram group or or uh facebook group if you prefer whatever you wherever you feel like and we'll kind of add some more of, of details about this so thank you guys so... thank you for being here and, so happy uh, to share our beautiful day with you. Yes. That is another kind of relationship, right? Mm -hmm. And I, Sean, I'm still see, uh, seeing your hand. Uh, if you want, just uh, send us a message or, or, and we'll be happy to, to get to that. Giving a big, big, big hug and uh, so much love and so much light and have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. And we'll see you again next week. Yes, Gail, mm -hmm. Telegram group is Beyond T, just uh, Google Beyond T. Beyond T group. Beyond T group on Telegram, you'll see it. Mm -hmm. um, and by the uh, way, you can all join Beyond T group because there you can share. Beyond T only is just one channel that we send and you cannot respond. But Beyond T group is where we can actually develop conversation. So uh, check your last email. There's a right link there if you want to share. Uh, to connect to the group where we can actually interact. Yeah, and thank you, Miriam, for wishing us many more committed moments. Yeah, this is how we go. Yes. And uh, we're off to more fun. <laughs> <laughs> Big hug and Ciao. much love, guys. Ciao. Mm -hmm. You too, you too. <laughs> thank you.